Before we get into the main thrust of what I want to talk about, I want to just look and take a quick survey of, of, of church history and scriptures that have been misinterpreted. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's even been misquoted as money is the root of all evil. And people have used that to say God wants you broke and God doesn't want you to have anything. But in the truth, he says, the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's about a heart motivation. You have other scriptures, Deuteronomy 8, 18, Philippians 4, 19, 2 Corinthians 8, 7, that all talk about how God wants to provide for you financially. Yet we've, in the, in, throughout church history, people have used this to prove that God doesn't want you to have anything. So there's a first example of a misinterpretation of a scripture uh, the next one, Second Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians fourteen, or First Corinthians fourteen four says, "Let your women keep silent in the church." And people use this to say that women can't hold positions of leadership and things like that. However, a few uh, chapters later, or a few chapters earlier, Paul gives guidelines of how women are supposed to prophesy in church. Well, how are they supposed to prophesy in church if they're supposed to keep silent? No, he was addressing a specific situation where, uh, and, and in, in the context points it out, he says, if they would learn anything, let them ask your husband at home. In other words, they were, they were disrupting the meeting, asking questions. Because in, that, in, in Corinth, the women weren't, weren't, weren't as educated as they are today. So they were asking rudimentary questions that and Paul in disrupting the meeting and Paul was saying hey you can just ask your husband at home because you're disrupting the meeting and today if Paul was writing the letter he might write and say let your women let your men keep silent in church so he was addressing a specific situation in that culture but the point I'm making is is somebody took a scripture isolated it from the rest of the body of scripture isolated it from its cultural context and build a doctrine on it and put women in bondage for years and they can't even do what God's called them to do. Another one, Psalm 20, verse seven. He says, some may trust in horses, some may trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of our God. People put that to say, well, see, that means we don't need a military because we just put all of our trust in God. No, if you study the scriptures, they had a military. But the, the thing is, is we just don't put our trust in that military. We use whatever means that means are at our, our disposal, and yet we put our ultimate trust in God. It says in, a, in another place, it, it, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain to build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So we put our ultimate, that means we put our ultimate trust in God, and we still build the house, we still guard the city, but we do so while trusting in God. And that, kind of, that brings us to what I wanna talk about and what I've been thinking about this week. First Corinthians two verses two through five, or actually four through five. He said, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Many people have taken this scripture, especially full gospel people, or what we call full gospel people, and they say, according to this scripture, scholarship is yucky. You know, scholarship's ungodly, and we're not supposed to, we're not even supposed to study, and we're not supposed to get theological training, we're not supposed to study original languages and all these things. And my problem, first problem with this is why, how do we keep making the same mistakes exegetically or through our Bible interpretation? You know, first we did it with the love of money. Then we did it with women preachers. Now we're doing it with scholarship. <laughs> and and the, the problem, a, a problem with that belief system is if you believe it, your argument's safe. Because if you believe scholarship is wrong, the only way people, anybody can correct that wrong thinking is through study so you've made the thing that will help you 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 villainized it you know and that's kind of the premise of second corinthians 10 4 the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god are the pulling down of strongholds uh, uh, 
casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captivity and ca uh, captive to the obedience of Christ. See, a stronghold is when you have locked yourself away in your own argument. And, and that's what that argument does. If you believe scholarship is bad, then nobody can, nobody can help you because you believe scholarship is bad. Um, and the thing is, is, is most people who, who, who espouse that, this notion really don't believe it. They will say, you're not supposed to study, but they'll quote the Strong's, which was written by a theologian. <laughs> Or they'll, they'll, they'll quote commentaries that were written by theologians. And, and, and what it really boils down to is, is you're not supposed to study any more than I do. You make yourself the standard. This is how much I study, and if you do any more than that, it's excessive. And even if Paul, in his day, said, hey, you don't need to study, you don't need, to, you don't need theological, or you don't need that, and he's not saying that, but just say he was. We have a, an additional hurdle that Paul didn't and Jesus didn't. We have language barriers. See, the Bible was written in the language of people, the Old Testament, primarily Hebrew, and then the New Testament, Greek, because that's what the known world spoke in that part of the world, spoke Greek. So it was written in the language of the people. Well, most people don't speak those speak those lines and also we have cultural barriers you know the eastern thought is different than western thought you know and uh and it plus it, it's two thousand years ago so we have these barriers that we have to study to overcome so if we carry the no scholarship idea to its complete end, we end up with a Bible that we can't read unless you know the original languages. But wait, you can't know the original languages because that would require study. Can you see the circular logic in this, <laughs> in this notion? So what did Paul mean? He said, my speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom, but demonstration of the spirit and the power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, first of all, if you're studying the Word of God, it's not the wisdom of men to start with. It's, it's not the wisdom of men. It's the wisdom of God. But uh, this, this, that was 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. Yet in 1 Corinthians 1, he uses several rhetorical devices that he would learn, have learned through his scholarly training. He uses a device known as anaphora, which where you use a, a, a successive phrases in the same way several times over. He says in 1 Corinthians 1.12, I say, each of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. That was a literary device. That was a, that was a rhetorical device. Rhetorical means a way of speaking, a way of speaking and presenting your argument and re 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 presenting your point of view. He uses another rhetorical device in verse 13. I'm not going to cover all of them. He uses a paradox in verse 25. He uses what's called as a tistrophe, which means repeating the same phrase at the end of a line. Now, you can't, you can't see this in English but because it, but it, the English word order has changed. But in the original Greek, he repeats the same end of the line in verses 27 and 28 of, of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So why did he use all of his theological training if it was somehow bad? So what did Paul mean when he was talking about not using enticing words of man's wisdom and not putting our, you know, trust, putting our trust in the power of God, not in the wisdom of men? First of all, he was coming against abuses, as many of the philosophers of the day that taught these principles said you can abuse these principles. A good example of that is a, is a group of people called the Sophists. The Sophists were a group of philosophers that could argue a point from both, both the positive and the negative. So just to use a contemporary example, abortion. You know, they could, they, could, they, could, they could give an argument for it and they could give an argument against it. And see, that's, that's an example of an abuse of these principles.
They're not speaking from their core values. They're arguing for the sake of arguing. They're arguing to show how smart they were. And that was an abuse. And it's just like these things, you know, he talked about horses and chariots. A horse and chariot, which would, <laughs> would correspond to our modern day tanks and guns and all these other things. A gun can be used to defend yourself and a gun can be used to commit murder. It's the same way with these principles. Same way with these scholarly principles. It's how we use it. We don't abuse these things. We use it to communicate truth. And we rely on the Holy Spirit, which brings us to the next point. He's also saying that although we use these natural means at our, disposable, our disposal, we don't give them the glory. For without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we'll never get understanding. The hearers will never get understanding and we'll never get understanding. See, he was actually, when he said, he said demonstration and power, he was actually making a play on what a lot of the philosophers of the day said. They spoke of the argumentative demonstration and rhetorical power. So they were putting, they, put, they gave all the glory to the system. They gave all the glory to their literary, to their rhetorical devices rather than glory to God. And Paul was pulling it out and saying, no, I don't use, my, I don't give my scholarship the glory, just like Jesus. Jesus, I mean, if you knew, and I can't get into it, but it says that Jesus went to his first Passover at the age of 12. Now, that don't mean that he hadn't gone to Passover before that. That means that was his first Passover where he was able to offer the Passover lamb for his family. And what that means is, is he, in order to be able to do that as a young Jewish, uh, uh, a young Jewish student, that means you could quote the law, the first, the, the, the first books of, of what we call the Old Testament by memory. He had it memorized. So apparently Jesus didn't have a thing against it because. But whenever Jesus was questioned about his doctrine, he says, my doctrine is not mine, but the father who gives it to me. So in other words, even though he used the educational system of his day, he gave glory, ultimate glory to God. Another scripture that people use in order to villainize scholarship is Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. And then we'll pick up and, and then we'll read 13 and 14. For we are circumcision who worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And though I might have confidence in the flesh, I, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, I've counted as loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, from whom I'm suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. King James says, says uh, dung that I may gain Christ and then picking up in verse 13 he says brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus and see and people say see he, 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 he says that learning is is poo poo. You know, learning's bad. Learning's <laughs> gross. No, he's saying he. You, you got to qualify it with the first verse. He says, "I don't put confidence in the flesh. I don't put confidence in my in my accomplishments because that's the way they did in that culture. If they were going to promote themselves, they would give their history. They would give their pedigrees. They would give their their scholarship. But he says, I'm not going to trust in those things to put me over. And he says, I forget those things which are behind and, and reach forth to those things which are ahead. And we always apply that to the bad. And, you know, the persecuting in the church, out of all those things, that was probably the only bad thing that he mentioned. All the other things were good. The scholarship things were good. 
but concerning the church but we we use this scripture and say you know if you've done all these bad things forget those things which are behind but reach for but really in context he's talking about all the good things you've done in the past you have to put those things behind you and reach forth you know you're you're not done you don't need to spend the rest of your life reminiscent of the glory days you need to press towards the mark of the prize of christ jesus and what he's called you to do but it's not talking about that scholarship is bad. It's saying, I don't put my trust in those things and I don't put my trust in my past experiences and what I've done. A really good thing that illustrates this is a, a testimony I heard Rick, Rick Renner. He built the first Protestant church in the former Soviet Union. I mean, and the government opposed him on it and they tried to block his building and they tried to block him receiving his building. You know, he, he had bought the building from the United States and put it on a ship and they, they shipped it over. And while it was in the ocean, one of the government officials tried to block him. And so God intervened through a, through a, a U.S. ambassador, called him at that time and said, is there anything I'd help you with? And when he, when he said, I, when, he says, yeah, they're, they're trying to block my building. And so that ambassador went to bat for him. And just so to the providence of God, all these opposition, he finally got the building built. And he said, and this is Rick Renner's testimony. He said he was in the, and he would go in there every day and just look around and just say, wow, look at this. The first Protestant church in the former Soviet Union. And, and finally the Lord, after several, several days of that said, how long are you going to be joined to your idols? And he said, Lord, what do you mean? He says, he said, you still have more to do. You know, you may, you may think you've, you've done a lot, but there's still more to do. And you're just camped out here resting in your past victories. Now, does that mean, you know, if, if you, you, you apply the same logic that the people apply to these verses, that would mean that Rick Renner did a bad thing by building a church in the Soviet Union. No, it wasn't the building the church. It was camping out and not moving forward and camping out on your former victories. You know, uh, and, 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 and a big problem with this whole notion among full gospel, not all full gospel people, we have full gospel scholars, thank God, but there's very few faith scholars, people in the faith movement, because they've somehow thought that it was banned. And the problem is, is we should have faith people on the trans translation committees whenever they're translating Bible translations. We should have, we have original language studies from that perspective, but we've outsourced all these things to people that are not sympathetic to faith people. And a lot of them are very Calvinist and they're very, you know, <laughs> and we wonder why. And, and then what happened is, is because we've abandoned it, then it gets worse. And then we villainize it worse. We'll see scholarships bad because they hear what they're teaching. But it ain't the scholarship, it's because we have not been a light in that place. And we haven't brought our perspective to that place. Uh, the reason secular academics is so in the ungodly shape it's in is because Christians have abdicated their representation in those areas. You know, people say, well, this ungodly stuff they're teaching in universities and in the schools and things like that. Well, the reason is, is because Christians think it's yucky to study, so they're not representing us in those areas. This whole notion of ungodly scholarship is a, is a new notion. And you know, if, if you look on a lot of the Ivy League schools, many of the Ivy League schools start out as, as ministry training center. You'll see on their, uh, you see Hebrew writing on a lot of the universities because, and, and used to, even economics was studied along with the Bible. It, and, it's, and, and that's the reason they've got so goofy in their economics is they've taken it out of the spiritual and put it in the natural. But that's the reason secular am academics, we need to be a light in those places. But if we're going to be a light in the academic community, we have to learn something. And so yeah, this, this, this whole notion of rejecting scholarship is a master stroke of satanic genius. We have to reject it. We got to cast down those thoughts and use whatever means at our disposal, but don't give glory to the scholarship. Give glory to God.